Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. We're here today to share some good news for our economy, Vermont employers, and those in our workforce. I'm pleased to be joined by members of my team and representatives from the business community who will share the details of continuing cost reductions in Vermont's workers' compensation market. As you know, two of the top priorities of our administration is to grow the economy, adding more people to the workforce, but doing so is critical um, to reversing our demographic crisis that we face and growing our tax base to pay for critical services and important initiatives. For our economy and workforce to grow, we must address the high cost of doing business in Vermont. One major expense for Vermont businesses is the price they pay for workers' compensation insurance. A 2017 study from our Department of uh, Financial Regulation found that Vermont employers were generally paying 10% more for workers' comp than employers in New Hampshire and Maine, solely due to Vermont's benefit structure. Protecting employees and taking care of them when they're injured on the job is important. But we also know the high cost of workers' comp insurance has been a factor for some Vermont employers when deciding to move or expand in our state, to bypass salary increases for their employers, or delay making a new hire. The good news is we can address both. That's why I instructed DFR to implement many of the recommendations laid out in their 2017 study, which was designed to reduce workers' comp insurance costs without reducing the benefits afforded to Vermont workers. These efforts have directly contributed to lower rates. And today, I'm pleased to announce that workers' compensation rates in Vermont are decreasing for the fourth consecutive year. This year's decrease represents the largest single-year rate reduction in more than a decade. When combined with the uh, rate reductions over the previous three years, a Vermont business on average will pay about 30% less for their workers' comp coverage today than they did in 2016. As well, data from the recent workers' comp filing shows the Vermont economy is experiencing payroll growth largely driven by increased wages across all economic sectors. In addition to other factors, this also suggests many Vermont businesses are reinvesting these savings in their workforce. These good results could only be achieved through the teamwork of everyone in this room and employers and workers across the state. Our business community is committed to safer workplaces, reducing the frequency and severity of workplace injuries. The Department of Labor, who has pro proactively worked with employers on voluntary work, workplace safety assessments and best practices, uh, played a factor in that as well. The Department of Financial Regulation has been putting into place innovative approaches where appropriate and vigorously reviewing the annual rate filing in the insurance age, uh, industry, including the National Council of Compensation Insurance for working with DFR to implement these initiatives over the past four years. These results are important for Vermont businesses, and I thank you for your role in pl in play uh, that you played in this success. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Pichuk to uh, provide more detail on DFR's most recent efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Governor, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today uh, for this uh, important announcement. Uh, as the governor stated, Vermont has experienced a dramatic decrease in his worker compensation insurance these past three years, and now we're pleased to announce the largest rate reduction uh, in more than a decade. The new rates will be effective on April 1st, 2020, uh, with an across-the-board rate decrease of 11.6% in the voluntary market loss cost and a decrease of 12.6% in the assigned risk market. When combining these rate reductions over the past four years, uh, Vermont has not seen a cumulative rate reduction this significant during any point of the last two decades. In 2017, our department took a fresh look at the worker comp insur insurance space, and we completed a detailed study examining the reasons why Vermont businesses were paying a disproportionately high rate, especially businesses in high-risk industries, like the dairy industry, like the logging industry, uh, and the skiing industry. Certainly, our generous benefit structure for injured, for injured employees contributed to higher costs. For example, Vermont has one of the highest maximum weekly benefit allowances in New England. However, 
Our department and the governor was not interested in proposing benefit reductions, but rather exploring new and innovative approaches to our current system. Now, many of the initiatives that I'm about to describe are highly technical, but they're also highly impactful for Vermont businesses. First, DFR improved and refined the actuarial rate calculation, which serves as the basis for all rate setting in this space. This has resulted in a more consistent rate that reflects the actual loss in the Vermont business community, and in this case has provided premium rate, rate relief and greater rate stability. We also removed a surcharge that had been applied to the assigned risk market, as we determined that experience no longer justified this surcharge, resulting in a 6.7% direct premium relief to Vermont businesses in the assigned risk pool. We also lowered the mandatory difference in price between the voluntary market and the assigned risk market from 25% to 20%, which more accurately reflected different risks presented in both of those markets and resulted, again, in rate relief. DFR also took an innovative approach to a specific challenge that had been experienced by log haulers. Log haulers had paid disproportionately high worker comp insurance comp rates, uh, even though they had experienced no accidents and had a very high safety record. Partly those rates were due to the fact that their pool was so small in Vermont. Uh, many uh, states in New Hampshire, Maine, for example, had a much bigger pool and their rates were lower because they could rely on their own experience. By taking an innovative approach of combining log hawker, ha haulers with contract truckers, we were able to reduce their worker compensation premiums by 24% in a single year. So that was a very um, innovative approach to an issue that had been challenging for that industry for quite some time. We've also worked with the Departments of Labor and, uh, and the Departments of Forest, Parks and Recreation to establish a new on-site job safety program for non-mechanized and mechanized logging operations that, when passed, will result in a 15% premium credit for those businesses. And finally, in this year's filing, DFR has revised a rule that will reduce by half the price that certain small businesses, usually one or two person businesses, pay for worker compensation coverage. That premium relief, we believe, will lead to uh, increased coverage for small businesses uh, and allow them to put uh, their hard-earned money in other places that will help benefit their company. I want to thank some very important stakeholders and members of our DFR team for getting this great work done. Uh, I first want to thank the National Council on Compensation Insurance, or NCCI, represented here by Chris Rice. NCCI does a lot of important work in the worker compensation space, including gathering data, analyzing trends, and ultimately providing our department with recommendations. Many of the initiatives I just outlined could only be implemented with their open mind and their willingness to work with us. Uh, and their commitment to uh, reducing the cost uh, experienced by Vermont businesses as well. So thank you very much. And also want to thank the steadfast work of folks at the Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, without their work, we certainly uh, could not have made the progress that we have made. I want to particularly thank the leadership of uh, Deputy Commissioner Kevin Gaffney, uh, Rose Raska, Jessica Sherpa, uh, and Pat Murray, who are all uh, here with us today. Uh, your work has appreciably moved the needle for Vermont businesses, has certainly improved uh, the, and lowered the cost of doing business in Vermont, uh, and that is something that we can all be very proud of. So thank you very much for your good work. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Commissioner of Department of Labor, Mike Harrington. Good afternoon. Uh, today's announcement is great news for employers in Vermont and is another great example of government and private industry coming together to grow Vermont's economy. In recent years, the state has seen a decrease in the number and severity of workplace injuries. This reduction has played a significant role in lessening the financial burden insurance rates put on employers and in no small way is a sign of the importance Vermont employers put on safety. Within the Department of Labor, our Workers' Compensation and Safety Division includes the Vermont Occupational Health and Safety Administration and the Project WorkSafe program. These safety initiatives, as well as our Workers' Compensation Unit, are committed to maintaining the safety of Vermont's workplaces while ensuring employees who are injured on the job are able to return to work as quickly and as safely as possible. Like 22 other states, Vermont operates a full state-run OSHA program known as VOSHA. In 2019, this team of 11 conducted 308 workplace inspections and received over 50 whistleblower complaints. 
In addition, the team provided technical assistance to a multitude of employers, industries, and organizations, ensuring the safety of more than 300,000 employees that work in our state. Similarly, our Project WorkSafe program, which offers voluntary consultative services for Vermont businesses, provides free support to employers through conducting risk-free on-site safety audits. Businesses who partner with Project WorkSafe are able to address potential hazards before they become violations. And since 2014, Project WorkSafe has conducted over 1,000 consultations, resulting in over 6,000 corrected hazards. These two programs have had a direct impact in reducing the number and severity of in injuries in the workplace. Finally, through new and targeted initiatives that were just recently mentioned, Vermont is working with various industries such as the logging and ski industries as well as the dairy industry to find new ways to reduce rates and compensatory damages for employers, in turn allowing them to reinvest those savings back into their businesses and their workers. I'd now like to invite Kevin Gaffney, Deputy Commissioner for Insurance at the Department of Financial Regulation to share uh, some more information about the rate reduction. Good afternoon. Uh, the uh, insurance division at the Department of Financial Regulation, as Commissioner Pichek mentioned, has some key um, participants that actually make this pro program work. And I know he recognized them, but I want to specifically explain what role they serve. Uh, Jessica Sherpa uh, at the insurance division is kind of does the day-to-day -day operational uh, review of contracts that come to marketplace. Uh, and she does an excellent job of that. She also does a lot of coordination with the Department of Labor on how we triage uh, consumer inquiries and complaints. Rosemary Raska has been an integral part of our rate review process. Uh, some of the uh, details that uh, Commissioner Pichek talked about, uh, one, for example, is the surcharge for the assigned risk plan that we removed a few years ago. The convention uh, at that time was that the surcharge would serve as an incentive for employers to uh, be safer, that if they had a large loss and received the surcharge, they would be more safe and be uh, operating in a more safe manner to avoid a future surcharge. Um, we really look at it differently now. We've changed that convention, and we're looking at uh, the ways we can incent employers to be safe, but also give them the tools to be safe. So one of those examples is the uh, logger safety program that we've worked with the Departments of Labor and Forest Parks and Recreation and Steve Monahan with the Department of Labor and Sam Lincoln Deputy Commissioner with Forest Parks and Recreation have been uh, integral parts of that process. Um, last week we actually undertook a series of public meetings uh, held in the three corners of the state in the Northeast and the Central Vermont and Southern Vermont and actually engaged in uh, detailed conversations with employers in the forest industry. At the table were insurance representatives of insurance companies, insurance agents, the logger uh, education to advance professionalism known as LEAP program was there. And uh, we really had a lot of good dialogue and feedback. We gave them some tools on what we think what they could do to be safer in their work. And one of the key components of this is actually on-site observation of their work site. So training in a controlled setting like this is instructive and helpful, but the real impact is to observe the work in the woods. And uh, we've gotten good feedback from them. We're ready now to move ahead with the actual on-site inspections. Several of them have conducted training and are ready to be certified. So when Commissioner Pichek talks about the 15% decrease, uh, we're ready to uh, have those in individual employers get their employees certified to take advantage of that decrease. Uh, there's a couple of other just uh, uh, aspects of the change that are important to, to note. One is we, this year with this change in four, on 4120, we reduced in half the minimum payroll requirements for sole proprietors, LLCs, or partner owners, or executive officers of businesses. And what this means is right now the rule says you have to just rate it to the state average weekly wage regardless of what the actual payroll is. And that creates kind of a, a barrier sometimes for small employers who are reinvesting in their business, trying to hire two or three additional people and don't, can't afford to protect themselves. By law, they can exempt themselves, but we lowered the barrier in half because we heard that their decision not to protect themselves was more financial than uh, a need to, uh, that they didn't see value in the coverage. 
So um, we've seen uh, actual an example of that at our meetings last week where one of the employers said he was able, with our reduction in the workers' comp rates for the forest industry, which has been up to 50 percent the last four years, uh, to hire an additional person and with this change in the rule actually cover himself as the owner uh, where he wouldn't have otherwise and he has a family to protect and himself to protect. So that's good news for the employers. It's good news for their ability to expand their business. Um, and then an, another um, uh, uh, component of this is outreach. So while we do this, we see the insurance industry and the insurance agent in particular as the key cog in educating employers, working as liaison between the employer and the insurance company. So Pat Murray and the insurance division has been participating with myself, Sam, and uh, Steve Monahan on the outreach activities. Uh, so we're finding this a very valuable blueprint for to carry forward to other high-risk industries as we uh, as we move forward with those endeavors. Um, at this time, with the snow falling and more big snow coming, I want to <laughs> I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Molly. Molly Mahar. Sorry, Molly Mahar from the president of the Vermont Ski Industry uh, to the table to talk about how these changes impact her uh, her uh, members. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of our member Alpine and Cross Country Ski Area members, the Vermont Ski Areas Association would like to thank Governor Scott and his team for their strong support for business. Of course, we're talking about workers' compensation rate reductions today, and that is a great example of that support. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Pichak and Deputy Commissioner Gaffney for, and the Department of Financial Regulation for doing the detailed analysis and making the adjustments in the uh, workers' comp rates uh, to further reduce them. And I'd also like to thank Commissioner Harrington and the Department of Labor for the willingness to work proactively with our ski areas through programs like Project WorkSafe to do safety audits and increase training to help make our ski areas safer workplaces. And I'd also like to commend our ski areas as well for increasing their effectiveness and success in this area. Safety in the workplace is not just creating a plan, talking to your employees, and filing it away in a, in a filing cabinet. It takes leadership, focus, awareness, and daily diligence across all levels of a ski area to have a safe workplace. Workers' compensation premiums can range into the six figures for some of the larger ski areas, so a 10 to 14 percent reduction is a real savings, and of course it's good any time we can reduce the cost of doing business. We're talking here about insurance costs, dollars and cents, but there's another result. And the real bottom line is our people. They are one of our most important assets, and we want and need to keep them safe on the job so they can return home whole at the end of the day, and that needs to happen every day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Molly. And uh, at this point in time, we'd like to open it up to questions, uh, on topic questions, if we could at first. What, give us a sense of the cumulative savings between um, the rate change this year and then what it, you know what it was three years ago or four years ago. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it certainly is millions of dollars. If you took the exact uh, decrease of the rate by the amount of the premium, you know, you're getting a number that's in the thirty to forty million dollar range. Uh, but like we mentioned, there's also been payroll growth. There's been uh, some employment growth as well. There's been some additional coverage as well. Uh, and that's why we're saying it shows that that savings is being reinvested uh, into um, the workforce. Uh, so the savings would be millions and millions, uh, well north of uh, you know, $30 million, if you did it based on the direct premium and the rate reduction. Over the last four years? Over the last four years. How much does this save the average employer? I know they're kind of different industries we're talking, but I mean, we kind of have a sense of the average cost savings. Well, yeah, I would welcome anybody else to, to uh, come up and answer the question, but uh, every business is different. There are different classifications uh, depending on the, the type of work you do. Uh, so there are higher rates, lower rates, and some of the higher rates are in the, uh, the logging industry, high-risk businesses and so forth. So they will probably reap the most benefits uh, at this point in time, uh, but uh, maybe someone from labor or Mike or... Well, I mean, the one classic example that Governor mentioned is sort of uh, you know, non-mechanized logging. Their uh, rate was uh, over $50 per $100 of payroll. So if you were paying someone $100,000, you would have to pay $50,000 in worker compensation costs just for that one employee, uh, for that one salary. Uh, now their rate is down to under 30. It's around uh, $28. With the premium credit, it could go down another 15%. 
Uh, so just in that example, that would be tens of thousands of dollars of savings for one employee. Uh, other industries don't have as high uh, worker compensation costs, so even though they're seeing great rate reductions, they might have less of an aggregate savings. But certainly uh, on the high end, it could be tens of thousands of dollars per employee uh, for Vermont businesses. I'm kind of surprised to see craft brewers on the list. Is that considered a high risk business, and if so, why? Uh, they're not uh, considered a high-risk uh, business, but they are an important industry for Vermont, and that's why we uh, called them out uh, in the press release. So it's, it's based on uh, payroll times risk? That's a computation? Yeah, I think that's uh, right. I mean, basically, you come up with your uh, rating factor, and that's uh, times the amount of payroll that you have in a particular company. And you have different classifications within each yep. business as well, um, depending on the category they work in. Uh, how? You talked about how we were uh, well ahead of New Hampshire in cost. Uh, how are we today? Uh, have they seen the same corresponding decline? So we, um, this year, for example, uh, have one of the larger uh, decreases in New England. Uh, the other states have not changed their benefit structure, so there's still an inherent um, you know, uh, increase in Vermont because our benefits are more robust. But even that being the case, we've still seen rate reductions this year in particular that are greater than uh, some of our surrounding states. Uh, I think nationally, we were like the fifth lowest or the fifth highest, if you will, rate reduction this year out of about uh, 40 states that do it uh, through uh, public or, or private insurance. So um, these are significant um, nationwide and in the region as well. Were there any uh, losers, as it were, as a result of, of any of the actuarial changes or yeah. risk pool combinations? So the one, who are now paying a little more than they would have otherwise but for those changes? Yeah, so obviously whenever we're going to make a change like that, we want to look at who's being benefited and uh, who might not be benefited. And all of the initiatives we talked about have only benefited the marketplace. The log hauler example, uh, for example, you know, that combined with, log, with the contract trucking uh, dr dramatically decreased log haulers. But because their experience was so good, it actually had a slight positive impact uh, on the contract trucking code as well. So we obviously look at that to make sure that there aren't winners and losers. We're really trying to figure out ways that uh, we can provide a net benefit uh, to the entire industry. Is, can, to what extent can this be attributed to just the economy and changes that are sort of happening uh, outside of DFR? Uh, and I guess someone had mentioned that maybe like less accidents were happening on the job. Yeah, so I think certainly as the governor said, it's a team effort. Certainly businesses being safer, uh, new technologies being implemented by businesses, better use of data and analytics by businesses. Uh, certainly the work of the Department of Labor, making sure that those standards are in place, voluntarily working with businesses as well. Uh, but then, you know, the significant impact of DFR's work, I think, can't go uh, understated. I mean, these certainly have surcharged the uh, decreases that we've seen uh, over the last four years. I think, you know, it can't be overstated, uh, the amount of work we've done, interagency work, uh, and that's been really instrumental in trying to reduce these rates. It took, it took uh, Sam Lincoln, for instance, the deputy uh, commissioner, to come up and tell us uh, there's, there's uh, the, the suffering uh, in terms of the businesses in the, in the uh, uh, industry, logging industry, uh, were significant, and, and they weren't able to compete anymore. So that brought the, the issue to the forefront. And then working from there with uh, uh, DFR and the Department of Labor uh, to try and work together uh, to reduce these rates was significant. It wouldn't have happened without that joint effort. Okay. If you'd like to stay, you can. If you would, <laughs> would like to move, that's fine. <laughs> President Trump was acquitted in the Senate trial. <clears throat> what is your reaction to that? Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was unfortunate that more witnesses weren't able to come forward. Um, I thought it was uh, courageous of uh, Senator Ron Romney uh, to step up and um, and take the action that he did, uh, and knowing uh, that there may be ramifications as a result when he didn't have to take this step, uh, and he did, um, and it, it was shows a lot about his character and integrity. We can only hope that uh, if we're in that same similar situation that we we do the same. Um, I think about John McCain, for instance. I think John McCain, you know, I think about that a lot. What would John McCain do? And I think that he'd be very proud today of what Senator Romney did uh, because that's what John McCain would have done based on whatever evidence that he might have uh, have seen uh, and to draw that conclusion. Is that what you would have done if you were? It, you know, it's hard to put yourself in that position. I can only hope that I would do 
the right thing, uh, and I try and do that every single day. Uh, but uh, but I can see uh, myself trying to adhere to the same standards that Senator Romney or Senator yeah. McCain well, did. Put it another way, after you have heard all of it, as the rest of this did, how would you have voted on the article? Again, hard hard to say without being in that situation, without sitting through all the. Uh, days and uh, maybe weeks of, of testimony, not understanding all the details. Uh, but again, I, I believe uh, that the president abused his powers, uh, and uh, and I, I'm not a you know it's hard in some respects for me uh, because I'm not a supporter. I didn't vote for the president. Uh, I don't believe that he should be uh, in office. So um, I think that uh, at this point in time he's been acquitted. I think it's for the voters to decide in November uh, whether he should continue in that role. But do you think he should have been removed from office by the Senate? Well, again, that was almost a foregone conclusion. If they had taken more testimony, maybe uh, they'd had more information and maybe other uh, senators would have acted uh, appropriately. Uh, so without that information, you know, I, I, it's hard to say w why or what, why they were doing what they were doing, uh, but. Uh, but I'm asking how if you think yeah, that he I, deserved to be removed. Yeah, I, again, I don't. I believe he abused uh, his position of power. Uh, withholding uh, some of those funds is inappropriate, and uh, and I believe that uh, I believe as uh, Senator Romney did uh, that he shouldn't be in office. Uh, Will you say that? Yeah. Again, I mean, I, it's hard for me to say what I would have done exactly. I'm not there. I'm not a senator. I didn't sit through all the, of the hearings. So uh, I'm just saying I uh, would hope that I would do the same, same thing that Senator Romney do, did and, st and step up and, uh, and, and do what I thought was right. Uh, and again, I'm not in the Senate. Uh, I didn't get a vote, uh, but I can only hope that I would do the same thing. When you say you think you should not have been in office, you said before you didn't vote for him. Do you think he should not have been elected, or do you yeah. think he should have been removed from office? I don't. I don't. I wasn't a supporter of the president. I didn't vote for him. I didn't support him along the way, um, and I won't vote for him in uh, November. Uh, but um, but it was up to the Senate to decide. This is a political process, and and unfortunately, uh, they didn't allow more witnesses, so we didn't get to hear all the evidence that I think we should have heard. You just, just to be totally clear, though, you're saying based on the whole of the information that you've seen, you think that uh, Donald Trump should be removed? I, I think he abused his power. Uh, and I, believe, I don't believe that you should use that position uh, in the way that he did to affect a future election. Uh, and, and I think that that's what he did. Before the Senate trial, you said you had faith in the institution to conduct a fair trial. Yeah. Say, yeah, I don't think there was a fair trial. I, I think they should have uh, had more witnesses. I, I, I said that from the beginning. So uh, I don't believe, um, I, th I think they did harm to the process by not allowing more witnesses. And I think that, that, uh, that most, you know, it's, it's probably still split, uh, but I would hope that most Americans would believe uh, that uh, that you need all the information you can possibly get uh, to arrive at a decision like this that is so imperative to our country uh, and in our democracy. So uh, I I think that uh, there's a there may be a lack of, of uh, faith and and trust in the institution at this point in the process. But did you did I hear you say that you thought that the decision that Mitt Romney made was the correct? Well, based on, you know, I listened uh, to his reasoning. Uh, it made uh, sense to me. Uh, and again, I wasn't there. I didn't hear all the evidence, um, but, uh, but I have a great deal of respect for how he arrived at his decision. Uh, he, and he did so knowing full well what the ramifications might be. So again, I would hope that if I'd heard all the information and come to the same conclusion, uh, that I would have the integrity to step up and vote my conscience. Sounds like you're saying the Senate should have voted to impeach in this case. I'm saying uh, that uh, I have a d great deal of respect for Senator Romney, uh, and if I had been there as a senator and heard the information and, and co come to the same conclusion, that I would have, again, the integrity to do what was right. And I think he did what he thought was right, and I would do what I thought was right if I had all the information. Yeah, Attorney General right now is defending the Department of Children and Families in a case uh, down in southern Vermont, and they reviewed the uh, confidential files of jurors to determine whether or not they should remain on the jury. Uh, there's questions whether that's legal or not. Is this something that uh, you're paying attention to in D.C.? 
the yeah. We we had I've had uh, been briefed on that uh, and what I've read uh, in the in the media. Um, it sounds like there's ambiguity uh, in the law, uh, and if um, I, I think if there is continues to be ambiguity, uh, that we should come to some resolution on that or change uh, change the law to make it clearer. Um, so um, the, the attorney general uh, did what he thought was right. Uh, the defender general doesn't believe that that's appropriate. And I think the uh, the legislature will probably take a look to see if we should make changes in the law to make sure that it's clear. Why are you convinced that it's a question of the law not being clear rather than the attorney general? Law? Well, I'm not a lawyer, um, so the attorney, attorney the attorney general uh, believes who is representing us as a state uh, believes it was okay to do within the law. So I have to uh, again rely on him uh, for that information. How does your general counsel read the law? Um, ambiguity. Uh, it could be read either way. Uh, can you tell us what you have decided to do regarding the minimum wage bill? No. You have not decided? <laughs> I have not decided. You have until Monday? I have uh, till Monday. Uh, there are three paths, obviously. Uh, I can sign the bill, uh, let it go into law uh, without my signature, uh, or veto the bill. That would be it, yes. Uh, what would it be? I'm weighing on all three. Does yesterday's outcome change anything? It, it does not. Every every issue is separate from my standpoint. But you've all, often talked about these things aren't separate. You have to look at everything collectively. And now sure. that you, in, in, the, the, these things don't, these policy reforms don't occur in a vacuum. They're part of a package of that need to be considered collectively. Um, so I, I vetoed both these measures in the past. Yes, but now that you know that this uh, mandatory payroll tax isn't coming down the pike, does that at all make you uh, more willing to consider something like the minimum wage bill? Again, I, I will look at this uh, individually uh, and, and collectively, but individually in this case, and I'll make a determination by Monday. Before Monday? Um, by Monday. <laughs> it won't be Friday. Pardon me. It will not be Friday. Oh. <laughs> Your uh, corrections commissioner said in an event earlier this week that he thinks that the Chittenden Regional Corrections Facility should be closed. Do you agree with that assessment? Um, I, I think we've agreed uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we put forth a, a plan uh, that would have uh, replaced that facility uh, amongst many others. Uh, it wasn't well received by the legislature, uh, but we're still uh, willing uh, to do whatever we can to, to change uh, the method of incarceration. Uh, and I believe that we're uh, we've been, you know, our department has been working on uh, a different uh, different way. I think there's a Connecticut plan and there's some others uh, that are out there uh, that we've been been looking at. By Connecticut plan, do you mean sending only prisoners to Connecticut? No, 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 no. Uh, it's just a different method uh, of uh, incarceration for uh, f female offenders. Uh, and it's a step down approach. Uh, but, but we took a look at that. I think we had. Our, our commissioner had gone uh, to Connecticut to take a look at what they're doing and to see if it would be appropriate for Vermont. So we're looking at just different different approaches. Apart from building a new prison, have you heard any ideas that would allow a woman to move to a separate facility in, say, the next year? Um, well, I think uh, this, this step-down approach uh, has has some merit, and uh, but it would still take uh, a, another facility to do that. So. Uh, we're willing to work with the legislature on this uh, and to try and determine uh, the best approach as we move forward. But, but again, uh, to reiterate, we, we believe uh, that the, the facilities that we have today are outdated. Uh, a number of them are outdated uh, and need to be upgraded. Do you think the state has the money to build a new prison? Well, again, we, we had come up with a, a different approach um, two years ago. Um, and uh, m more of a lease purchase type of arrangement, uh, which could have could have worked. So uh, that's still on the table as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the House is likely going to be voting on the marijuana market bill next week. Um, the bill has addressed a lot of what you had identified as concerns. There's uh, roadside saliva testing with warrants. They're open, um, I think, to funding your education prevention initiatives, at least some of them, including your after school program with um, that money that would come from the uh, market. Um, are, are you hoping that they're going to send you a bill that, that you can sign this year and that you can 
sign of into law a legal well, again candidate. this isn't my initiative uh, I laid out uh, those three conditions uh, and uh, if they meet them to, to my uh, satisfaction then I'm willing to sign it does it sound like from what you're hearing that you're going to be able to sign it, it sounds as though they're moving in the right direction uh, but uh, but again uh, I didn't uh, I didn't foresee uh, any court warrant of any sort uh, this was a saliva test uh, side, uh, on roadside saliva test so the warrants is an issue for right. you you you'd like the saliva test to be legal without the need of right. obtaining a warrant to use it right would that be in and of itself enough for you to that would be enough for me not to support it governor following yesterday's uh, failure of the veto override vote uh, Mitzi Johnson said that uh, she felt that several members of uh, her body had received invitations from your administration to discuss that vote did you actively engage with members of the house and try to sway their vote on that well it's issue? a and so, yeah it's a fairly normal po process uh, for us to make sure we know where everyone stands. Uh, we knew what the vote was uh, coming out of the, the House at that point, uh, who was uh, in favor and who was not. Uh, so uh, we wanted to make sure we knew where we stood. Um, so we did uh, had my staff reach out and make sure that the people were going to continue uh, to, uh, to either vote, vote no or find out what they were going to do uh, in the, uh, in the potential veto override. So yes, we, we reached out uh, in a number of different ways. This is a normal process in this building to find out where everyone stood. And did you have some meetings on those subjects on the morning? They did. I found out based on your question from me last night, um, I did uh, find out this morning. Uh, we did request uh, two uh, meetings uh, with two different people uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, office here. Uh, none of which that uh, I was uh, attended, uh, but uh, but the staff had. Who were those people? Um, one was Representative Reed, uh, and uh, one was uh, Representative from uh, Enosburg. I'm sorry. Re uh, yeah, Representative Fergard. I'm sorry, Representative Fergard, Representative Reed. Okay, and the goal of those conversations was to make sure that those well, find, representatives voted against the override? Well, find out them. if they were changing uh, their position or uh, in the case of Representative Reed, for instance, uh, it was just a recent appointment mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that he understood the process and, and understood the, uh, what, what this meant uh, in some respects. Uh, he had voted in favor, uh, I believe. Uh, so it was just, uh, just trying to make sure that he understood uh, what what this meant to the whole process. Do you have any sense of whether the House is going to find a way to reconsider that vote yesterday? And if so, what would your thoughts I don't know. I mean, it's always a possibility to risk in this building. I, I've seen it done before on other pieces of legislation when I was presiding over the Senate. Uh, you have uh, the next day uh, someone who votes and is on the winning side uh, can ask for reconsideration. And uh, I would not be surprised at all if, if, if they weren't, uh, the Speaker wasn't working on trying to make that happen. Can you be clear, as clear as you can, about who would be able to avail themselves of your plan, a voluntary paid family and medical leave program? Who in the state would be able to sign up for that if they wanted to? Any, Anyone. Any worker in the state of Vermont? Yes. No matter how many hours they work, no matter what wages they work, no matter where you are. They um, there are conditions, and, and maybe uh, Commissioner Pichuk, if you could tell us what those are. but. Uh, yeah, so the, the concept was that there would be um, a similar uh, work requirement. I think it was a little less than what 107 was requiring, so about 1,000 hours, maybe 1,025 or something like that from the previous year. So that would make somebody eligible on an individual basis. But the employers obviously have the opportunity to voluntarily participate uh, as well. And, and uh, can you give us a timeline of when those, uh, that program, those benefits will be available to the Vermont workers? Here, this we have the, uh, the RFP out now. Uh, we're hoping to hear, I think, by next Friday, uh, get the response uh, to the RFP, uh, and then we have uh, a few months, a few weeks. We have until uh, late March. Oh, late March uh, to to uh, negotiate and see what uh, different provisions are, are being uh, are, are being included in, in those bids, and determine who we want to go to. But I would I would say that this would uh, could be put into place at least a year before uh, the other proposal uh, that failed the, uh, the, to pass yesterday. How so the other, what's that? How much more expensive will it be? 
be for a worker who takes advantage. How much more expensive? Well, the voluntary paid leave. We don't, I mean, it's hard to know until we get the uh, response to the bids. Uh, we are anticipating it's going to be uh, under $300 uh, per employer, uh, employee uh, per year. Um, but, but you have to factor in as well. Uh, there will be some businesses who might take advantage of this. Um, so there, instead of being on the, uh, on the backs of, uh, of, of the worker, uh, it could be uh, supplemented by employers as well. In some, in some cases, it might be uh, included as a benefit. What about someone who, or, you know, their place of business doesn't offer this, um, or that, you know, they basically want opt in themselves, um, even though no one else at their business does, uh, does opt in. Um, is there going to be, is that, a, is that an option? And is it that is going to be considered it is more an expensive option. for that person than um, someone who works somewhere where no one else is opting in? Well, it's hard to say again until we get the, uh, the response, uh, but, uh, but it is an option for them uh, to, to be included in that way. The, uh, obviously, uh, the larger the pool, uh, the lower the rates, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to attract more employers and employees, and, but we'll be able to try it out and see. Uh, over the next, uh, if we put it into place, uh, and then we can gather all the data uh, from there and determine where we go from, you know, whether it needs to be changed in any way. You said a uh, fundraising email recently related to the paid leave issue. Um, it was it was a it, it was a letter uh, sent out to uh, to get people active to understand what this meant uh, because uh, the more people I talk with over the last two weeks, uh, the more uh, I think Vermonters were unclear as to who was paying for this, um, and uh, and we just wanted to bring some clarity to that. But then it was also soliciting. Yeah, tagline at the end, sure. And just like, just like any, uh, whether it's a media source like uh, BPR or Vermont Digger, there's always a tagline to, to donate to this cause. Do you have an active re-election campaign? Right now? Not active, no. But we have some volunteers that are are hoping uh, that uh, we'll be able to position ourselves to make a decision and give us flexibility in, in determining what to do. You're still not going to say anything until May. Um, yeah, nothing official. But you, um, are you, are you really undecided about keeping another job? Sure. You are. Yeah. It's not so much fun anymore. <laughs> well, I didn't, it's never been fun. Uh, and, you know, my, <laughs> my staff always cringes when somebody says, uh, it's, 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 you must have a lot of fun in this position. Well, I don't believe it's fun, nor do I believe it should be. That's an incredible amount of responsibility. And if you're having too much fun with it, uh, maybe you're not in the, in the position for the right reasons. Sure. But it's a lot of work and it's something just like it, just like any Just like any, just, well, I have satisfaction. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's things like today. Uh, look what we've done. You know, uh, working together and trying to lower the cost of living for Vermonters and Vermont businesses is incredibly rewarding. Trying to help uh, point this uh, this state in a different direction, and trying to to uh, to to change uh, uh, the demographics of the state and the economy and so forth, and we make and we make improvements. It's incredibly rewarding. But you're fighting a supermajority or close sure. to one every day. Does that uh, eat away at your satisfaction? Well, n not when you are able to provide results. Do you worry though that you would be handing the election to the other party by? Making oh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I'm. I'm sure that if I decided not to run, there'd be others who would step up. Who do you think should step up? If you don't I don't know, but I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, if you late. Yeah, <coughs> I'm sure Xander could could step up. I'm sure he could. And um, Stuart here, you know, well known. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> Well, again, I, I think uh, there would be other people who would, uh, would step up uh, and come to the rescue if that were, were to happen. Uh, but I'll be making a decision by the end of, uh, the, end of the legislative session. The uh, Vermont Business Roundtable has raised attention to an issue that they think is being ignored in the State House now that the Treasurer is suggesting increasing the sort of teacher OPEP funding and the a representative of your administration said, you know, before we make that decision, let's have a bigger discussion. What do you think that discussion should look like? Well, 
well, again, it's a four and a half billion dollar obligation uh, that uh, has been uh, talked about a lot uh, by a number of different people, but not a lot of interest in this building to do anything about it. Uh, it continues to to get a little bit worse uh, this year. Uh, payments about 199 million dollars, about eight million dollars more than last year. Um, so uh, if that if we continue down this path, we're never going to get ahead. Um, so we have to to come to some agreement, and, and I believe that the it's it's an important issue. Uh, and if uh, if the uh, bonding um, bonding companies um, continue to look at this as a as a problem a problematic uh, in, in terms of our bond rating, um, then it costs uh, it costs us money uh, in doing so. So uh, I think it's appropriate that we talk about this, um, but we need to do it collectively. We can't, I, you know, I can't do anything about it. Uh, uh, individually, uh, but um, but again, if the legislature is interested, we're, we're more than willing to have the conversation about where we go from here. Why do you think it has shown such little interest in the taking this issue? Um, I, I, I think it's easier just to push it off to the side uh, and hope it gets better, but it's not getting any better. Your director of racial equity testified to House Natural yesterday about Act 250. Um, do you agree with and support and endorse her testimony? I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what she testified uh, to in that uh, in that committee, so I don't I can't react. You've um, expressed concern about the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, <clears throat> I think because of the ability for residents, citizens of Vermont to sue the government, the state government, if those uh, goals are not met. Uh, some of the lawmakers putting that bill together say that there's not going to be civil penalties that the state you know, would suffer under that? Do you, do you still have concerns about that approach? I, I, I do have uh, concerns about that. I, I'm not sure that that isn't the case, but uh, I, I believe that we're setting ourselves up for failure in some respects and uh, certain some, certainly some liability. Is that because you don't think that we're on track to hit the I just the think that it... I think that, as I've said before, I think that our, our view on the trajectory uh, of where we can be uh, in terms of uh, reducing our carbon emissions, my feeling is it's much different than theirs. Uh, and I believe that we can, we can both arrive at the same, uh, same end, uh, in the end zone at the same time, uh, but, uh, but along the way I think it's going to be different based on technology and changes and, and uh, consumer behavior and so forth. So, it's just a question of what what are those you know arbitrary uh, goals and are, and are they attainable? But why do you say that those goals are arbitrary? Those Bec goals that you said that you want to see. I, I didn't say. I said that uh, we can we can agree on the beginning and the end uh, in a certain period of time if we want to do that. Uh, but how we get there and setting those arbitrary goals uh, in between, are, I think we're we're in much uh, different different camps on that. Your uh, representatives have expressed the view that the media hasn't been fair in covering your uh, work on climate change, and I'm wondering if you can point to sort of what you've done during your time in office that really proves that you're serious about this issue. Well, I think just the, the charging uh, stations in particular, uh, the um, EV incentives, uh, all the things we're doing with the uh, weatherization. Um, we spend $11.7 million in AHS alone. Uh, and when you include uh, the other efficiency, efficiency Vermont and so forth, we're spending $38 million a year in, in uh, weatherization. Uh, I think we could do more. I, I, I've offered uh, that uh, if we have a surplus at the end of the year, uh, that we take at least a quarter of that and put it towards um, climate uh, change initiatives, weatherization in particular, maybe more electrification. Uh, but I'm very bullish on, uh, on our transportation sector in and, and we've, we've actually been doing it. So, and it's included in my budget again this year. And I just haven't seen uh, where others have come up with initiatives uh, that, uh, that compare to what we're doing. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it.